Hey everyone, so now that I've reached 1,000 of you, I've made a very comprehensive video going over my top private CRISPR companies, summarizing them, what I like about them, what ranking, and when they might be going public. So that is what's going on in this video. And if you're new here, you can see the channel name, so if investing in CRISPR interests you, definitely subscribe for more. And this video also comes with a big announcement. Number one, each month I'm going to release a complete summary and overview of every current public CRISPR company. So Verve, Beam, Edit, CRISP, Intellia, GRPH, and CRBU. Recapping everything important from the prior month and looking ahead. There are currently the seven companies that I just listed. So there will be seven five to eight minute videos that will be going out at the beginning of the month covering the previous month. I will also potentially be offering weekly five to seven minute recap video of all the CRISPR companies and looking at their stocks valuations and what to look ahead for the next week. And those two things, the monthly summary and weekly updates will be exclusive perks, but available very cheap. And before you say, why the heck are you charging? I would never pay for something I can get for free. Well, number one, I'm still going to continue to put out all the normal content on my channel for everyone. This is something I'm offering in addition, which is going to take a huge amount of research and time, and I believe provides a lot of value in return. So I am just asking for two bucks a month for the weekly updates and four bucks a month for the monthly updates and five bucks combined if you want both. So if that interests you, you can get access to these videos through my Patreon, which is linked right below in the description. And if you're still listening, I will say that being a college student doing this alone and creating this content takes a huge amount of time and research. And while I love doing it, I don't make a penny off this channel right now. So offering this exclusive content will help me keep doing this and hopefully give you a lot of valuable information. And if you have feedback on this, if you like this a lot or think there's a better way or price, don't stop yourself from leaving a comment below so now to get into things my top list of private companies based off or connected to CRISPR at the moment is the following number one we have prime medicine out of any company right now that is private that I want to invest in besides Neuralink and SpaceX this is right up there at the top Prime Medicine was founded by David R. Liu and Andrew Anzalone, who created the Prime Editing Technology at Harvard. Prime Medicine has licenses from the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, where they discovered this technology for commercialization. Prime Editing is the forefront of gene editing right now, and a great example of how quickly this field is progressing. And a simple way to explain it is think of your generic CRISPR-Cas9 system at the base. CRISPR-Cas9 causes a double-stranded break at points in the DNA to attempt to knock out certain genes and stop them from being expressed. Then we have base editing, which is invented in 2016, also by David R. Liu, among others. Base editing works similarly from the CRISPR-Cas9 system in that it uses a CRISPR RNA to find and match to a targeted area on the DNA. But when it's time to edit, there is an attached base editing enzyme like deaminase, which you can chemically change a base letter to another. So you know the four bases from high school biology, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thionine, which make up the DNA. And so sometimes genetic diseases can be caused by point mutations, meaning just one letter, so one base is incorrectly swapped for another. So base editing lets us go in and fix that directly, either C to T, T2C, A2G, or G2A. So it is limited to those changes, but can still do a lot with just that. And of course, all of that without the mess of causing a double-stranded break in the DNA. And so incredibly, branching even more off that, we have Prime Editing, which is cutting edge and just announced in a journal article in 2019. Now the analogy has been if base editing is like a pencil, Prime Editing is like a word processor. Prime Editing tech has a similar foundation to CRISPR-Cas9 and base editing, but differs with its prime editing guide RNA, abbreviated PEG RNA, which has the standard CRISPR RNA ability to match with and target DNA sequences, but also has an additional sequence which contains instructions for the desired gene editing. And included in the system is a version of the Cas nucleus, which instead has a Cas9 nickase, which literally nicks the DNA instead of creating a double-stranded break. And this nickase is fused to a reverse transcriptase, together called the prime editor. And so essentially, without getting into the chemistry, the prime editor allows for non-double-stranded break editing to happen and works with the PEG RNA to make this happen. And so 
With this upgraded system, prime editors can do what base editors do in addition to actually being able to change every single base to another base. So not limited like base editors are. They can also substitute mutated base pairs, remove extra base pairs, and amazingly insert base pairs. So when you're thinking of gene editing, prime editing looks to be the most sound gene editing technology ever. Now that said, base editing looks to have higher editing efficiency so far and fewer indel byproducts compared to prime editors. And on the flip side, prime editors are more precise and also have more flexibility. So prime editing doesn't just make base editing obsolete. And so going back to Prime Medicine, the company, really what's important is the technology at this point. They've got great leadership led by Keith Gottsteiner, the CEO, who has a lot of experience in the pharmaceutical industry and working with the development of therapeutics. And also worth pointing out is John Evans on the board of directors of Prime. John is the CEO of Beam Therapeutics, if you do not know that already. The biggest news with Prime Medicine recently was them coming out of stealth mode and announcing $315 million in financing in Series A and B rounds. So they're coming out strong, and I would expect them at this point to go public, likely within the next 12 to 24 months. Probably closer to the two-year mark, but who knows. Beam Therapeutics went public roughly three years after it was founded, so Prime Medicine going public around two years from now would be a similar time frame. Number two, we have Mammoth Biosciences, which has really emerged in the last year and a half with COVID-19 coming out, and it is based out of Jennifer Downa's lab, co-founded by her, along with Trevor Martin, Janice Chen, and Lucas Harrington in 2017. The company is now worth over a billion dollars, and Mammoth, as you might know, is based on a diagnostics approach using CRISPR. Their platform is based on the detector system, which searches for specific nucleic acids in a sample using CRISPR nucleases, which are programmed to search for specific gene sequences, detecting a virus, and then activating a cleavage capability to signal that said target has been found. And so this detector system, MAMA says, can be applied to all sorts of other diagnostic applications, like single nucleotide polymorphisms, SNPs, which tracks disease inheritance, bacterial infections, cancer screening, antimicrobial resistance, and viral infections. The CRISPR detection platform can provide results in 20 minutes, instrument-free and programmable and optionable for any DNA or RNA target. With respect to COVID itself, Mammoth is looking to roll out its COVID-19 diagnostic test, which uses Cas12 enzymes for identification and is developing a scalable piece of equipment to synthesize thousands of tests per day without much need for interaction and monitoring. And Mammoth early in 2021 announced they are partnering with Agilent Technologies to launch its test and want to connect it to Agilent's system to increase speed even more. And what's really interesting about Mammoth is that they are not just focused on COVID-19, but using their technology and research to find and discover other Cas nucleuses with having discovered Cas14 and Cas5, which are much smaller than earlier enzymes like Cas9, which allows for much more mobility. And so Mammoth says on their website these smaller enzymes might allow for editing that other enzymes aren't able to do. And enzymes like Cas12, Cas13, Cas14, and Cas5 are not only great in showing what Mammoth has done, but provide great validation to the protein discovery method which has produced this. So while COVID has been a big focus, it's clear that expansion into other areas and innovating in this space is important. And that brings us to this $1 billion valuation, which the company recently raised just shy of $200 million in early September to get them there. They've got a large base of investors, most prominent being Apple CEO Tim Cook, so clearly a lot of support. And in my opinion, it's probably justly valued right now, considering how much potential the company's got. Something I've followed closely in the last few years is how diagnostics looks to change the cancer industry. If you look at the numbers, even with the worst cancers, if you can diagnose cancer early, you can eliminate it quickly and easily in many cases. But creating cheap and easy and precise diagnostic kits is going to be key. And companies like Mammoth are showing we are getting closer and closer to this. So I'm very excited about CRISPR's role in the diagnostic space. As for investing in Mammoth, while the CEO of Mammoth, Trevor Martin, has addressed IPO before, there's nothing known in the immediate future about IPOing, especially considering the company just raised a bunch of money. 
Now, seeing their $1 billion valuation and how quickly they might grow, I would very much expect them to IPO in the next year potentially because if they're looking to scale up quickly, having access to the public markets to raise capital might be beneficial for them. Next, we have Sherlock Biosciences. Sherlock Biosciences was founded by nine individuals listed here, with the most notable being Feng Zong. Sherlock is extremely similar to Mammoth Biosciences, also being a diagnostic company, but just being connected to Zong's camp, which is totally split from Doudna and company. The company is spun out of IP and research being developed at the Broad Institute and Harvard University's Weiss Institute. And I'm going to be a little more descriptive with Sherlock than Mammoth, not because I think they're better than them, but because they've included more information about their platform on their website. So Sherlock is using CRISPR and synthetic biology to tackle the diagnostics industry, basing the company out of two platforms, Sherlock and Inspector, both acronyms. Sherlock stands for Specific High Sensitivity Enzymatic Reporter Unlocking, and that technology was developed out of Zong's lab at the Broad Institute. The technology being a means of identifying genetic targets using CRISPR. Sherlock can detect genetic fingerprints across multiple organisms or sample types and has been described in four papers published in the journal Science. The other platform, Inspector, short for Internal Splint Pairing Expression Cassette Translation Reaction, is a synthetic biology-based system developed by a co-founder, James J. Collins, at the Weiss Institute at Harvard. Inspector can be programmed to identify targets based on a single nucleotide at room temp. Using these platforms offers access to diagnostics without using complicated instruments and in a variety of potential environments. And these tools could be used in areas like precision oncology, infection identification, food safety, at-home testing, and disease detection. So a lot of potential application like Mammoth. Taking a little closer look at each platform, we have Inspector, which continuing along the lines of how simple it is, can be adapted on a paper strip test or provide an electrochemical readout to be read on your phone. Sherlock Biosciences is developing an instrument-free handheld test for COVID-19, similar to what other diagnostic companies have produced. But seemingly, this would be even more easy to use and potentially even more accurate. Inspector consists of synthetic biosciences, which can detect a nucleic acid target and, in response, create a reporter protein. And then that protein can be exploited in some way to inform us that the target has been spotted and to respond accordingly. Now, switching to the Sherlock platform, this is the more progressed platform, which uses CRISPR for smart amplicon detection. An amplicon is a section of chromosomal DNA that has been amplified and reinserted elsewhere in the genome. The big thing with the Sherlock tech is that it has already produced a COVID-19 diagnostic test, which has been FDA authorized, emergency authorized to be specific, and technically the first FDA authorized technology that uses CRISPR, albeit not fully approved and they are partnered with Binks Health in this venture. So how exactly does Sherlock use CRISPR? Well, essentially, in the way that we can program a CRISPR molecule to target a certain area of DNA, we can program CRISPR to target and search for a genetic signature, such as that of a virus like COVID-19. And so the company has exploited this and built upon it to result in a signal from it as well to get the diagnostic information. The test can produce results in under an hour and is flexible, being able to use saliva in other means. And then the sensitivity, being able to just detect one molecule in a sample is very impressive. So right now, Sherlock has this test kit, which can use saliva as a sample and works by extracting RNA from it, amplifying it, then using CRISPR to detect and search for COVID, then reporting it. So what are the benefits? Well, it's faster than a PCR test, able to get results in just an hour. You can add thousands of tests per day, so you can scale it up quickly. It has 100% specificity and sensitivity, and it has a small footprint. Now, as far as investing in Sherlock Bio, the company was founded so recently in 2019, so an IPO, while I would imagine will be in the not-too-distant future, it's not expected to happen anytime soon. The company has raised around $50 million so far, but even being so new with how fast they've had to grow with the COVID opportunity, I would expect an IPO in the next few years with this current trajectory. So next up, we have Excision Biotherapeutics, not being connected to Feng Zhang, Jennifer Doudna, or David Liu. So it's not quite as well known as some of the other main companies, but is developing quickly and impressively so. 
The company is based out of Camille Kalili's lab at Temple University. Kalili is a microbiologist and immunologist whose first work with CRISPR to remove HIV DNA from host cell DNA inspired the Excision Biotherapeutic spinout and founding. Excision is working on using CRISPR to combat viruses, which really was what CRISPR's evolutionary job was. Bacteria develop this CRISPR defense to fight and slice up viruses. And as I said, they aren't connected to Jennifer Doudna, but they do have a license from their lab to use CRISPR technology. Their approach is using CRISPR guide RNAs to slice up large sections of the virus's DNA to eliminate reproduction and escape. And they also have licensing for CASX technology from the Doudna lab. And those being potentially better because they're smaller and can fit into smaller delivery packages like adeno associated virus delivery. Their main therapeutic called EBT101 uses Cas9 with AAV delivery containing dual gRNAs to target HIV virus and this therapeutic most recently saw its IND approved by the FDA so they will now begin clinical trials. So really Excision is a much further progressed company than you might think. They have three other programs. EBT103 targets PMLJVC, which is a devastating virus that attacks the nervous system and brain, and that is using triple guide RNAs for T antigen recondition. Then EBT104 is for HSV, herpes, and that is being designed for AAV delivery or non-viral Cas9 quad gRNA therapeutic. And then finally, EBT107 HBV, which is hepatitis B, capable of AAV or non-viral CASX dual gRNA therapeutic. An excision was founded in 2015 and most recently raised 60 million in February. So as they look to begin clinical trials, I would not be surprised to see them go public within the next year. So next up, we have Scribe Therapeutics. Scribe is a company that excites me a lot, especially considering the company's relation to Jennifer Doudna and her lab over at UC Berkeley. Scribe was in fact founded by Jennifer Doudna along with Benjamin Oaks, Brett Stahl, and David Savage in 2017. Scribe was in stealth mode for a while until October 2020. The company announced a collaboration with Biogen worth up to $400 million, but an initial $15 million upfront payment to create CRISPR-based therapeutics for ALS. And these therapeutics center around this CASX enzyme, which the Dow in the lab revealed in a publication in the journal Nature in 2019. CASX is interesting because it was discovered in groundwater, particularly within Archaea, which makes this really interesting because the Cas9 enzyme, which you've undoubtedly heard of, was discovered in a bacteria cultured in labs. And this CASX enzyme is really interesting because it is much smaller, and so a much more fundamental version, you could say, of what Cas9 is, for example. So CASX offers itself as an enzyme that can be manipulated to do more specific tasks. And the best part is that its immunogenicity, which is the immune response to a foreign enzyme like Cas9, would appear to be much lower with something like CasX, considering it doesn't have any human relation. So Scribe Therapeutics has launched their X editing using XE technology, which is based off this CasX enzyme, but develops more complex systems by branching off that smaller structure. And you can see all these different areas Scribe is targeting to address with the nervous system. Interestingly enough, a big priority as a smaller size of CasX makes it a good fit for AAV delivery, short for adeno-associated virus delivery. But the key is that Scribe took this CasX enzyme and used it to iterate on and develop an even better molecule that can be delivered using AAV. This is what Scribe is built for. This CasX molecule itself isn't the holy grail, but its simple structure makes it easier to take it and manipulate it and construct something far more intricate and precise compared to the Cas9 enzyme, for example, which was already complex when we found it, but we never had an input on everything about it, like its size or specificity. One final thing to know about Scribe is that in March, they completed their Series B funding raise of $100 million. And that was in March of 2021, so the company is starting to expand quite a bit. It's still early for them to go public, 
probably at least one to two years before that. But right now, Scribe has enormous potential in the gene editing arena, and we may see them go public sooner than you'd think. Next up, we have Pairwise Plants, which there's not too much publicly available information on the company, but I will say that this company has huge, huge potential. In my opinion, a less risk bet on CRISPR technology compared to companies using CRISPR for therapeutic development, while potentially getting even better returns in those companies. Pairwise Plants was founded by the same big players in the CRISPR arena, Feng Zhang, David R. Liu, and Keith Zhang, who have also co-founded Editas Medicine and Beam Therapeutics. And these guys are at the forefront of the CRISPR sector, with David R. Liu having major roles in the base editing and prime editing technology that have recently been discovered and iterated off the original CRISPR tech. And of course, Zhang and Zhang have continued to produce excellent results from their research. And a lot of what Pairwise Plants is doing is pretty self-explanatory, but they are essentially using CRISPR to make enhancements to plants for improved agriculture, whether that be by eliminating pesticide need, making plants grow quicker, bigger, or produce sweeter tasting fruit, or even be disease resistant. And of course, you can imagine all the other things we can do by having complete control over the plant's biological makeup. Pairwise has CRISPR IP licensed from the Broad Institute and from Massachusetts General Hospital and are collaborating with Bayer, a German company that's involved with agriculture, to work in corn, soybeans, wheat, cotton, and canola plants. And one interesting one interesting thing they say on their site is that fruits coming from the genus rubus so that means berries well there's only a few we actually have access to like blackberries and raspberries but there are hundreds of varieties that can be unlocked and bred on scale for commercial disposal so that's something they're working on the current plan is to launch their own branded fresh food in stores and restaurants in the next few years and they expect product number one to be a thick leafy green like kale or spinach but a different new variety, entirely different. So that will be very, very cool. The company's advertising will work entirely by word of mouth, essentially, if this works. And you can see on this chart or timeline, which is their planned path to market, and it really is a pretty thorough process to get to market. And I mean, that's pretty much it, but really there's a lot to be excited for with Pairwise. For a company that has the power to make pitless cherries and seedless raspberries and blackberries and beyond, this is a company to keep on your watch list. Considering the company was founded in 2017 and still only has a valuation, probably less than $100 million right now, it's still early for the company and an IPO likely won't happen until they start or start getting close to getting an actual product on shelves. So I would say maybe two to four years before an IPO, but who knows? It may come earlier considering these founders' experience with IPOing their other companies. Next up, we have KSQ Therapeutics, a company you probably haven't even heard of, but is actually a really big dark horse right now in the CRISPR arena. KSQ Therapeutics has several CRISPR-based drugs in development, with one actually that is in clinical trials right now. The company was founded in 2015, so it's been around actually for a good amount of time with respect to how new CRISPR is. The company came out of stealth mode in 2017 with $76 million raised and was founded by David Sabatini, William Hahn, Jonathan Weissman, and Tim Wong. All these guys have impressive backgrounds. And I'm going to give you a good summary of KSQ here, as good as I can, but since it's not really talked about much, I'm going to consider making a separate video dedicated to just going over KSQ. So if that does interest you, let me know in the comments, and if hit the thumbs up, and if we get 500 likes on this video, I'm going to put that video out. But anyways, the company is based on its so-called CRISPRomics drug discovery pipeline, a supposed formulaic method of deriving optimized drugs via gene exploration. And the chief scientific officer described this well in 2017, saying essentially, the human genome has over 2,000 genes, but we can't distinguish the best targets for most drugs. But CRISPRomics lets us pinpoint the optimal nodal targets of disease with great pre precision and speed. So what's unique about KSQ compared to the other main CRISPR companies is that they have developed a platform to optimize drug discovery using CRISPR compared to building the company around CRISPR itself for creating therapeutics. So your next question is naturally, if they don't have the IP to use CRISPR for editing, then what's the point of having a technology that just optimizes drug discovery? And the answer is that they are approaching this from both sides. On one hand, they have developed their own drugs that don't use CRISPR. So for example, their most progressed therapeutic, which actually has begun clinical trials and has dosed their first patient already called KSQ4279, 
and this is a molecule inhibitor of USP1 for solid tumor treatment. And so essentially this CRISPR omics platform identified the USP1 as a good target, which they then developed a treatment to inhibit it. And so that had strong preclinical results, which has them all the way to clinical trials. And the goal is to use this to branch off into more cancer treatment. Now what's cool is that they're also branching into actually using CRISPR, which they are partnering with CRISPR Therapeutics in. So essentially, and this partnership was announced around two years ago, is that CRISPR Therapeutics will receive IP for KSQ's allergenic CAR-T programs, and in return, KSQ will get CRISPR IP for its autologous cell therapies, including its proprietary engineered tumor infiltrating lymphocyte cell programs. So with this program, the goal is using CRISPR tech based on their crispr platform to develop T-cell therapies for solid tumors. And right now, their second most progressed therapy, currently looking to get its IND approved, is based on exactly that. And so we got to move on, but a few last things. You can kind of simplify what KSQ is doing to these four areas. Number one, targeted oncology, so tumor programs, solid tumors. Number two, immuno-oncology, T-cell programs, including solid tumors. Number three, cell therapy, dual edit ETIL programs, including PD-1 refractory solid tumors, and then autoimmunity, so immunoregulation, TREG programs, and autoimmune diseases. And KSQ has partnerships with Maxite, Ligand, and Takeda Pharmaceuticals as well with their programs. So a lot of signs point to a lot of potential for KSQ, and I would love to do a much more in-depth look at the company in a future video if we get 500 likes here. But moving forward, I could see KSQ having its IPO within the next year potentially. It's definitely well within range looking at other biotech companies timelines so definitely be on the lookout for that now moving on next we have refugee biotechnologies and there's two main things to know starting off number one is that the company is co-founded by and based off the work of stanley chi an underrated researcher involved with crispr who created a mutated cas protein called dcas9 that doesn't cut the dna like cas9 does but rather works just as a carrier to targeted parts of the genome and then once it's there a specially designed cell delivers a transcriptional activator or repressor that turns multiple genes on or off and this is known as crispr a or crispr i ARI is short for activation or interference, allowing for modulation of genes without permanent edits. And so number two is that Refugee is a company focused on cell therapy for cancer immunotherapy. And the goal is to expand off T-cell treatments by activating or repressing multiple genes simultaneously to make more potent treatments that manipulate cells beyond just a single target. And Stanley Chi, and you can see his resume here, is definitely an underrated CRISPR scientist who's done some really cool stuff. And the Chi lab at Stanford produces a lot of quality research. Refugee actually has a very robust pipeline with their first IND expected first half 2022 for RB340 and that is focusing on breast cancers and then RB312 for solid tumors expected IND second half of 2022. And you can see there are other programs in development here, a lot of them also getting close to that IND stage. And they don't have too much science on their website at the moment explaining each therapy, but I do think what they have here is legit and that refugee should be on your watch list with the current private CRISPR companies. They may be looking into timing an IPO potentially before clinical trials begin, so I would not be surprised to see an IPO in the works in the next one to two years. But overall, I'm looking forward to following refugees' progress in the next years. Next, we have Locust Biosciences, founded in 2015 by several guys listed here, one of the main guys being Rodolphe Berenjou, a professor at NC State who has had a big role in CRISPR since its discovery. Rodolphe's research has been tied to CRISPR-Cas immune systems in bacteria. Locus is built around CRISPR-Cas3 and bacteriophages, and Cas3 compared to Cas9 is a neat enzyme because it was built to destroy instead of creating a double-stranded break, and so Locus is using Cas3 to shred DNA of targeted bacterial cells in their creation of therapeutics. Locus's platform is built upon three main things, discovery automation, synthetic biology, and atlas. Their first being their focus on phage discovery and characterization. 
as well as next-gen sequencing. Synthetic Bio being for CRISPR-Cas3 engineering, and then Atlas being for their knowledge base and predictive algorithms. The ultimate goal is using a bacteriophage to deliver therapeutics that use CRISPR-Cas3 to target bacterial diseases like the ones listed here. Their most advanced program targeting urinary tract infections has already begun clinical trials, and you can see the many others listed here. It also looks like they're expanding into other approaches like anti-inflammation or gene editing, but those are very early in the works. They've got three main strategic partners at the moment as well, Janssen, Barda, and CarbX. The company has also built a 10,000 square foot manufacturing facility optimized for viral vector manufacturing, including bacteriophage, adenovirus, AAV, and other vectors. So with clinical trials, Locus already completed phase one trials for its E. coli targeting treatment for UTIs. LBP EC01 showed safety and proof of mechanism, which they expanded into phase two trials earlier this year. So for now, we'll see how that results. But Locus overall looks like a neat company using CRISPR in a different way than what's been more prominent using the sexy gene editing approach. I wouldn't be surprised to see an IPO in the near term if phase two trials start to signal an FDA approval could be in the works. Moving on, next up we have eGenesis, a company that is using CRISPR to improve organ transplant processes and spearheaded by none other than the great George Church, a pioneer in CRISPR and its implementation in mammalian cells. Like several of the other companies we've looked at, eGenesis was founded in 2015 by George Church and Luhan Yang. So, I mean, most people are aware that there's a large demand for organs, and there's a shortage of availability for organs in the world for people who are dying. And there's also this additional problem of organ rejection. Now, what eGenesis is working on potentially addresses both of these issues. One solution, and this has been looked at for a good bit of time, is using other animals to grow organs in and then implementing those into humans. The advantage is that it solves the demand issue. We can quickly raise pigs and harvest organs for humans, but the downside is that there is a far greater risk of rejection and contamination by trying to get a pig's organ to work in humans. That issue has been a killer for other companies trying to do this, but what CRISPR has enabled is for virology and immunology factors to be addressed by editing the pig's organs so that they're more compatible with the human system. So eGenesis is performing all sorts of bioengineering using CRISPR to grow organs in pigs that can be accommodated in humans. And right now, their lead programs for kidneys and illet cells, which are hormone-producing pancreatic cells, which are in preclinical development. They're also working on liver, heart, lung, and cell therapies, and you can see their pipeline shown here with the comparisons. This really looks like a promising application of CRISPR that, especially if it works, is going to be, in my opinion, a very important part in helping society adjust to the idea of CRISPR and gene editing because it is essentially applying it to humans in an indirect way compared to gene editing directly. eGenesis last raised $125 million in March 2021, so I would say they're probably closer than you would think to an IPO despite not having any programs actually implemented in humans yet. Next up, we have Ligandol, founded by Andre Watson and Christian Foster in 2013. The company is focused on developing delivery methods for CRISPR, RNA, and other gene editing molecules. Their company exploits the use of ligands, which are small biomolecules that can dock at areas on a cell. They have their own proprietary platform that is able to target very specific receptors on and within cells. They are also creating a peptide-based delivery approach for gene therapies. Recently, with the rise of COVID, the company pivoted to focusing on an antidote vaccine against the virus called SARS Block. They explain on their website that their peptide scaffolds will increase the immune response to COVID-19 and bond to the ACE2 receptor, preventing the virus from entering. We will see as they continue to develop this, but it seems a lot of their science is promising and the company has been featured in many articles and reviews. I would definitely continue to keep watching like Gandalf because I think delivery is becoming a critical part of this gene editing paradigm and those who develop the best techniques will be in very high demand. Finally on my list, and there are other CRISPR companies out there, but this is the last one I feel worth mentioning, and this is Inscripta. The company was founded in 2015 by Andrew Garst, Ryan Gill, and Tanya Lipscomb. They are developing synthetic and CRISPR-based nucleuses. The nucleuses include versions called MADZYMES that have apparent differing PAM recognition sequences, reduced sizes, and different movements. The big thing they have is their Onyx platform, which is based off these nucleuses they've developed and uses their patented CREATE technology, which 
which allows for a variety of edit types single nucleotide substations or large insertions and deletions and really onyx facilitates a ton of secondary abilities with digital genome engineering to track edits and different types and you can actually download the mad7 nucleus the company created off the mad nucleus program it's literally available for the public to use and simulate you would only have to pay royalties if you use it for commercial manufacturing and of course companies can purchase a commercial license to the mad7 nucleus so what other like actual products do they have well they have the onyx digital genome engineering instrument which automates large-scale experiments making it easy to compile data and perform thousands of edits they also have genome engineering kits that are customized per experiment and built to enable precise tracking and then onyx assays are sold offering analysis of instrument run and an analyzing the onyx cell library and you can see the three assays here lastly we have their inscripta engineering portal which is their cloud-based software and library that helps with data management and with their kits and the company has done well currently probably getting close to a 1 billion valuation and it's clear that their products have been in demand and scripta isn't a direct crispr play but more of a partial exposure to the sector as gene editing companies continue to develop companies like inscripta that are data-based and can do simulations and whatnot become very valuable so definitely a company to keep your eye on and a company that could ipo sooner than later and so that is the end of my list. This took a huge amount of time and research putting this together. So if you've watched the whole video, well, first, thank you. And second, I hope you learned something. And please let me know if anyone's actually watched this far by commenting CRISPR in all caps below in the comments. This is my longest video to date, so I am interested to see how many people made it thus far. And so one more time, looking at all, the list top to bottom is Prime Medicine, Mammoth Biosciences, Sherlock Biosciences, Scribe Excision Biotherapeutics, Scribe Therapeutics, Pairwise Plants, KSQ Therapeutics, Refugee Biotechnologies, Locust Biosciences, eGenesis, Ligandol, and Inscripta. So that's it. And again, if you are interested in the weekly or monthly updates, definitely check that out through the Patreon link. Thank you for your support, and I will catch you in the next video.